Um, first couple of words of introduction. Does the microphone work? Yeah. Um, Mark Spirileon, I joined McKinsey earlier this year in January. Uh, I have a startup background, so uh, I've been founding and leading uh, a lot of digital companies here in Berlin. I was CEO of Jamba, Studio VZ, My Hammer, most recently helped Vivendi build um, whatever, and now, come on in, uh, and now help McKinsey clients uh, be successful in the digital transformation. And the way Mark and I, and Mark will introduce himself in a minute, we're doing it is with a new part of McKinsey, uh, at least new in Germany, it's called McKinsey Digital Labs. Uh, what McKinsey Digital Labs does is um, do the digital transformation together with our clients uh, by a very simple method, and that is learning by doing. So basically what we do is we sincerely believe that if you want to be successful in a digital transformation, you really have to experience it yourself. And how do you experience it yourself? Is basically you do projects together with us, and what McKinsey Digital Labs then brings to the table is the people that have done this before. So we bring user experience designers, developers, agile coaches, and of course, you know, normal, normal software developers, software architects, uh, and we build new solutions or you know, dig digitization of existing customer journeys and processes together with our clients. Um, and in these processes, so they're always agile, they're always very data driven. Uh, we really help the clients experience what it's like to work in this way. Uh, uh, embrace the change, you know, start with a small cell and grow it within the company so that eventually, you know, you really digitize the whole, the whole company, you change the way of working, and you get much more into a startup working mode. Much more will you know, cover here. Over to you. So, so hi, guys. Uh, my name is Mark Boton. Um, within McKinsey Digital Labs, I'm responsible for design. Um, that's amazing, because I'm one of the few McKinsey people that does not wear a suit, which is a lot of fun <laughs> when I go to client meetings. Um, before I joined McKinsey, I was managing director of Fjord a service design company here in Berlin. Before that, I was working for TVWA, um, a big advertising company with a focus on digital, too. Um, and I think it's an interesting question. Why does a, de a designer join uh, a company like McKinsey? And I think the core reason for me is McKinsey is all around impact, right? And this is what design is all about. So if you, if you do good design, you do that to change the world to some extent or to make something better. And that's exactly what I guess we're really good at and what I guess we can do very well within that firm. So, and please, you know, since it's such a small audience, jump in, have, if you have questions, uh, things you want to say, we'll, you know, this is a workshop, should not be just a presentation, we'll do this interactive. Um, so, um, I think for a long time, and I, you know, having run uh, a number of these digital companies myself, uh, I think large co corporations were of the belief that, you know, we're big enough, uh, uh, eventually we'll be able to eat all the, all the small startups. I think you know, everybody by now has understood that that's not going to work, and uh, the large digital corporations are now larger than everybody else, and some even of the larger digital corporations have experienced themselves that they can be eaten by you know, what uh, Klaus Schwab referred to, the faster fish. Huh? So it's all about speed, it's not so much about size as if you are fast enough, fast in your decision making, faster in understanding what your consumers want, faster in delivering features, functionality, products, um, that's what really decides. So the question is, you know, being a large incumbent, what can you do to become fast? What we'd like to start with is, um, and we still hear that a lot, is to, you know, to start a bit with um, clearing up almost uh, some of the uh, thinking that still uh, exists around how startups work. I think, you know, if you've been to the conference and you listen to uh, all the folks over there, uh, none of this will be news to you, but to many of our clients it still is, and it's something we have to tell them over and over again. Um, so, a couple of examples on how some of these companies work, in particular how they leverage data. Uh, if you think of Etsy, you know, Etsy marketplace for probably people that if, uh, you know, the small craft people, 
uh, that very diligently uh, produce their crafts, many of them probably not being very commercial about it, but still I think Etsy has uh, enabled many of them to be extremely professional. How have they done this? By providing them with data and really helping these craftspeople to understand how their business works, how they can improve their business, shared with them best learnings, all that. It's a very simple thing, providing you know, a lot of data to improve the overall experience for everybody. This company we of course all know, use, even though around here it's a bit harder to use them. Uh, but they're, I think they're a prime example for even within an industry where probably we all thought, you know, I mean, this, you know what disruption is going to happen to taxis. Huh? Um, they're clearly demonstrating that it's, it's happening. Uh, and it's not just to taxis, of course, it will be all the last mile logistics that Uber is covering. Uh, uh, but data is the core driver for them. They've also done an amazing job in terms of user experience. Uh, but on top of that, I think the way they're applying data is, is the key thing for them. SoundCloud, uh, Berlin-based company, um, know many of the guys there. Uh, I think they've been looking for two years just at data and engagement to figure out what would be the best way to put advertising into their model. It was very clear to them from you know, very early days that advertising for them being a media company will be the way forward, uh, but they were extremely diligent, did a lot of testing, a lot of analysis on you know, what sort of advertising, where to put it in, uh, and, and how to do it. Airbnb, huh? same space, again, you, know, you had the home aways and, and, and many of the, uh, of the travel uh, companies, you know, nobody thought that uh, this sort of disruption would work in the travel industry. Even the, the early stage investors, you know, uh, I think admitted that um, they looked when they first were introduced to the idea, they looked at it and said, you know, this is an, you know, an utterly crazy idea. I mean, Eric Schmidt even said that, you know, for some of the plans he gets presented, he says, you know, this is pretty crazy and I'm not sure. Uh, it's going to work, but you know, he, as he did, he lets his engineers work it. And same here, the investors said, you know, it's a crazy idea, probably not going to work. But if it does work, it's going to be unbelievably big. Huh? So uh, the guys figured out how to do it. Again, data, I think, you know, on top of great design was the key driver for them. Uh, and finally, you know, something that um, I think has been online. Um, forever and still gets disrupted over and over again by uh, the next company, everything around dating. Um, uh, OkCupid is probably one of the companies that has done the biggest focus on data. They have a blog that just focuses on the data and just to share, you know, one interesting insight, huh? um, depending on what phone you have, what are your chances for having sex? There you are. Typical McKinsey analysis, so you know, and we haven't even done it, so they have done it, so great. So, okay, so let me let me do some design myth busting. Um, so one thing I, I tend to hear when I talk with people who have not really worked together with service designers is that these people tend to think, okay, we have these crazy guys, you know, that sit in a room and they all a bit strange, probably drink quite a lot or do other things, and then all of a sudden, boom, comes up a great idea, right? And that's based on aesthetics. So a lot of thinking is that we designers are actually doing things because we think they're beautiful and because we're kind of artists but potentially slightly better paid than them. That's not true. Um, so one thing which is relatively obvious, good design will always focus on users out there and m making them happy is really what we try. So that means we solve a problem, right? So good design is always built around the idea of solving a problem of human beings out there, and so therefore making their lives easier. And additionally, when we do these moments, when we create these moments where problems are solved, make them delightful, right? So produce a moment where people not only say, oh, my problem is solved, but as well say, that was good, that was really nice. So far, so obvious, but um, there is another point we focus on a lot, and that's making money. Right? So making good design that solves a user's problem out there and make the user happy is la polar. It only makes sense if it makes sense for business. So good design means we do this to help our clients to be more successful, to either save money or to make money. And then one thing that is frequently forgotten, this is an icon of an IT guy. You can imagine this relatively tough to do one 
Uh, this is where he has all his pens, right? So imagine this to be an IT person. So it needs to be doable, right? I mean, the, the greatest ideas that would you know, make a lot of sense for the users out there and make a lot of sense uh, for business out there, they will never become reality if they are not doable. And so this is what you look at when you design these three perspectives. And it's actually the people you need in one room as well. So you need someone to look from a user's perspective, you need someone to understand business, and you need someone who can actually build things. Because if you don't bring that together, there is no chance that you actually do something that is really good. Um, and there is one example which I think is quite a lot of you guys have already been using it, which, which makes, makes really the point, right? Checking in with your mobile device into your flight is exactly what good design is about. It solves a problem for you because it saves you time. I hate queuing, so obviously this has been made for me, but for quite a few other people as well. But it's great for, uh, for the companies because it saves them lots of money because there is no more human labor in this step. It runs automatically. And it is doable since we have the mobile devices and Passbook. It's doable in a very easy way. So that's an ideal example of good service design. And I'd like to show you one more uh, piece of work that we've been doing uh, within McKinsey. And obviously, since that always is better in a video, I brought a video for that, which I have to click. <laughs> So here again, you have the situation that you solve uh, a problem for the users, which is you know onboarding on a bank and using it. It's pretty horrible, really. You can make it easier, and it's good for the bank too because it reduces labor, so it makes money, um, and it's doable, right? So when that comes together, that's the situation where you can actually do new things, where you can actually invent new products. So there's. There's another point which is really interesting. OK, so we've seen this. We understand startups are capable of doing that. We understand startups use data to do that, right? So it's not only based on coming up with a great idea after you had a few beers. But how are big companies, big fishes, are able to then become fast fishes? What is it that we can do? How can we help them to do that? And I think Marcus wants to talk a little bit about uh, that it actually should be easier for a big fish to be a fast fish. Yeah. So 
I'm convinced, also having come from a you know startup background uh, and, and knowing what it takes to to build a large company, that actually you know the large corporations do have all the ingredients or many of the ingredients it takes uh, to be successful in this in this time and age and to become you know a uh, fast fish if you want. First of all, they have money, um, and yes, they're struggling. But if they think about their business and restructure it, and if you think of companies like Shipstead and uh, and the likes, or if you look at what Axel Springer is doing, you know they take every single euro they have available and invest it into you know b easy building the digital businesses, buying companies that are out there, or really embracing the change. So you know, take the money you have and invest it, invest it well, uh, and you'll see the results. Being a large company, you know, you have lots and lots of transactions, and that means, you know, lots and lots of data. Is all of that data collected? Is it available to all the people who should have access to it? Probably not. Huh? Um, you know, you heard Thomas Bubel from AXA this morning uh, when, he, when he said that. But in theory, the data is there, uh, and if you, you know, start getting on the journey of really using the data, then you have a huge advantage of all these startups out there, because they only start collecting the data. Yes, they have the advantage of building the infrastructure from day one with um, having data collection in their mind and providing the data straight away in the right dashboards and, and learning from them. But that is something still large companies um, can do, and the ones that are successful in doing it do exactly do this. People, huh? teams, we heard about it. Uh, one of the biggest challenges, even if you think of, you know, Oliver Samba last night, what's, you know, the three big challenges he had? One is team. People, people, people. There are, every large corporation has lots of people. And yes, you can look at these people and say, they don't have the capabilities, uh, and they work in a different way. But honestly, in all the work that we're doing, um, I don't believe that you can, you know, all these people have the right capabilities. You just have to show them and make them feel and experience a new way of working. And then they can, you know, they are more than happy to work in this new way. So in all the projects that we're doing, uh, you know, we're putting people into small agile scrum teams that take people from all of the organization, put them in a room and let them work together. And what happens? Those people will never want to work again in a different way. Which to all of us, you know, have worked in startups and worked in successful teams, we can all relate to. Uh, but in the large companies, something, you know, it takes a lot of convincing that it's necessary because everybody says, but I have to do this and this and that, and I don't have time to do that. And you just got to help them, you know, put your priorities in the right order and feel what it means if all the people that can make the decisions are in one room, but also if they have the executive support that they can make the decisions and they don't have to go back to some committee or, you know, be it a steering board or even uh, the executive committee to ask. Uh, but if you get the trust from, from the leadership to say, look, the people are in that room, they should be working on this problem, they should make the decisions. And finally, brands. Huh? I mean, this is just if you look at all the brands in there, and every single line has an incumbent company uh, uh, brand there, uh, and we all know these brands, they're all very well known. All of them uh, carry a lot of trust and, and other very positive um, uh, uh, you know, imagination from, from customers, and that's a huge asset to have. Because huh? you know, at Zalando had to invest a lot of money into building into building a brand, uh, and if you're a large company, you already have that, huh? and um, you should just leverage that much more uh, and try to build on that. And finally, customers. Huh? You have people interacting with your brand and uh, your product every day, uh, um, and many of them, you know, you reach without uh, doing large marketing spend. Um, so again, that's a huge asset to have. Uh, that you should leverage. Um, and that's why we believe digital trend, with all this in mind, you know, digital transformation for us can only happen from the core of a company, because it's the only way you can actually use all these assets that you have. You know, if you start out uh, in a building next door and you start from scratch or you start investing into startups, then you use, yes, you use your capital, but all of the other great assets that you have, you don't use. Huh? And at the end of the day, what will be 
you know, your result from, from uh, just investing into the startups, it's great for learning and all that, but will you be able to transform your core? No, you won't. You need to do it at the core. So, to make this a bit more concrete, how can you become a fast fish? And so yeah, one fun fact uh, on the on the orca, pretty big, can swim 45 kilometers per hour underwater, which is pretty fast as well, right? So being big is no excuse for being slow. You can be both. And when you're big and fast, you're pretty scary as well, which is kind of cool. So uh, there's one thing. Um, one of our clients um, likes to talk a lot about POs with us, uh, so product owners. And we think they are absolutely key to becoming a fast fish. So we'll spend quite a few minutes talking about them. When he refers to, um, to product owners, he always, and sorry for, the, for, for those of you who don't, who don't speak German, but he always ref refers to them as the CEO of a Pommes Bude. Um, so that's a, a French fry fast food thing, right? It's a very, very German thing. And I think he's right. But um, since we are in Berlin, I uh, obviously refer to a kebab place because that's, you know, for me, much more tangible. And then obviously, the Berliners of you know this to Mustafa's uh, Gemüse Kebab because he's, he's just magic. Um, so of, the, of those of you who don't know it, go there. You'll find out that sometimes you have to queue for more than an hour for a kebab, and people do this. And I think that's pretty interesting because if you think about this, man, and if you use the picture uh, for a PO, that's exactly what it is, right? So there is Mustafa. It's his place. He decides what to put in the bread. He decides how to do it. He decides on his marketing. He decides where he buys things. And he does changes very fast. So he does not only have vegetarian kebabs, which wouldn't work for me. He has ones with meat in as well. And they're great too. So the, the, the essence of the PO is exactly that. Running your own business. Being capable of making decisions. Deciding on the business model behind it making this successful, and as long as it works, you keep deciding. So that's probably the one thing we keep talking about a lot with the CEOs, is make sure that you have POs that can actually do this, that are capable of making their decisions, that are capable of running their products as if they are mini CEOs. But again, I think the Pommes Buddha, the um, Döner, or the Kebab uh, you know, um, preparer works a little bit better for me. But of course, it's not only done by um, uh, having the right PO and, and having your POs be entrepreneurial. They, of course, need a team. Right? And I talked, I started talking about that a bit. You know, you've got to put them into a war room. So probably, you know, not as you know, big a team as, as the one we see here, and probably not in the setting like this, but probably more in a setting like that. Right? And this is actually taken not from a startup. This is taken from a large company. Uh, you see, yeah, I think all the all the right ingredients there. There's uh, people in many different roles there. Uh, obviously, you know, you can see there's a lot of focus on on building software, building technology, and that I think we're convinced that all companies out there will eventually have to become uh, tech companies. I think the uh, Goldman Sachs uh, example that that Carl sh uh, shared with you this morning uh, is 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 you know, uh, speaks to that. Um, they, when Go Goldman CEO today, you know, talks of his company as being a tech company, because he, in comparison to LinkedIn and Twitter, has more engineers than these digital companies have. Right? And I'm convinced, and we all are convinced, that that is what will happen to every single company out there. Yeah? They'll all become tech companies. Um, go ahead. So there's, there's a few things you see in here which I think are utterly important. So the first one is, people actually talk with each other. Not through email or phones or whatever, but they actually sit in one room and they talk. So almost every decision is made informally through a normal conversation between human beings without the usage of technology. And that's one key thing, right? So very frequently, and the, uh, the clients we've been serving, what we saw is when we put the teams together in one room and make them actually talk, they solve problems because they want to get stuff done. And as funny as it sounds, for a lot of companies, that's 
been a big breakthrough because they all used to, you know, put them in funny silos, have IT there and marketing there and all, you know, spread the people, don't make them talk with each other. Worst thing is make them write emails that will never work. Not when you want to be fast, you need a room where people talk, where it's informal, where they actually become friends. Heard this from an IT guy who said, yeah, yeah, I can work with this PO because I trust him. Oh, that's exactly it, right? We're building trust here, and trust is, again, an informal thing that happens between human beings. And we haven't been that good in companies in doing this the last year, so that has to change too. So the other thing that you can see in this room, you know, if you want a team to be creative, there's a lot of research out there that the creativity of a team is linked to how much whiteboard space you give them. Huh? And if you walk around Silicon Valley, what do you see in every single room there? All the walls are whiteboards. Every single wall, the whole wall. Huh? And that's purely the reason. That's as simple as that. And the more, so if you want to limit the creativity of a team, provide them with a flip chart. Huh? It's very simple. No whiteboards, nothing, flip chart. Or you take even the flip chart away from them, then all the creativity is gone. Uh, so, uh, and as you can see here, you know, all the space uh, is used, and uh, um, it just helps us you know, be more creative when we have whiteboard space. So, so who, who else do you need in the team, apart from the PO? You, you need IT guys, because these guys build. And you need to be able to cope with them, right? Because a lot of IT people have a very interesting way of thinking. Well, at least as a designer, I say that. Um, but it's great, because you have a diverse team, you have diverse approaches to problems, and that is the foundation for better solutions. So yes, you need this guy in the room. You need the person who can actually say this is doable or not. And you don't want that person to you know, throw over a, a long document with specs, because then the, the standard thing you get back is this is going to take 500 years. You want that person in the room to talk and say, well, it's not exactly going to work like this, but you can do it like this. And this is how you actually get faster. And this is what happens in startups, because the people just turn together and work. Uh, and in the projects we do, you know, we probably don't bring guys that look as nerdy as this guy, but pretty close to that. Yeah? Um, so the people on, on my team here with Digital Labs, uh, the IT engineers, the architects that we have, yeah, are, you know, guys like him, very experienced, um, uh, and by, you know, all means, not the typical McKinsey consultant that you would expect, uh, but they are the people that can make or break things. Uh, so, you know, you need, you need them, uh, and it's great to work with them, and, and uh, they are key to building great experiences, and they are key to learning how to be successful in the digital world. And of course, you need designers. You know, not only because they can make things beautiful and are interesting people, um, but as well because designers stand there to bring in the voice of the customer. Now, you know, ideal design thinking would always be, as I said before, built around the idea what customers, what users want and what they need and how they tick, and around their emotions. And you need that in the room so that the solution that is built together has been built for a human being and has been built for a user. So therefore, these guys will be part of the team as well. Business people like me, you still need. Huh? Um, you still need to do, you know, the obvious presentation uh, to convince people that are not so used to this way of working. But it's getting less and less. Huh? If we think of these projects, um, there you don't have the typical, for instance, steering committee meeting every two weeks. But what we do is we take the steering committee with us in the room and we show them here is where we are in terms of building the software together with the teams. And it wouldn't be you know the McKinsey people leading those presentations, but it'd be the people from the client who are doing and showing, look what we have built over the past two weeks. And, and they develop you know a sense of pride because um, they can feel all of the sudden that things they never thought would be possible for them to do yeah, in terms of timing, in terms of creativity, and you know, the depth of the solutions they're building are now all of a sudden possible. Uh, and that, of course, you know, is a great thing for them to have. Uh, um, so, great way of doing it. So, um, and then there's one more thing that we found that is incredibly, incredibly important. I'm going to walk up the stage because I want to point a few things here. So, what you see here is a dashboard. <coughs> so, sorry again, it's in German, but I explain what is on there. Um, that we've been building together with uh, one of our clients. And one thing we find is, you know, developing products does not mean you just do it. 
without any control. Of course, control is part of it. You need to measure what you do. And there's a few things you need to look at. One is obviously money, so, but with a change. So with a lot of products, you know, what, we, what you tend to do is look into the past. It has been performing very well in the past. Everything is good. That is never going to work when you develop new products or when you work on products. So what you have to do as well, and this is what I personally find even much more interesting, is you have to project into the future what will happen based on the data I have, what will happen um, based on the, um, on, on, on the development pipeline, what will happen based on the sales pipeline. So these information need to be part of the KPI board uh, because, you know, surprises are not really what you want when you're the CEO. Another thing that is super important is actually sales, and that even when you are in an early stage and tends to be forgotten too easily, right? I mean, the best product is ridiculous when it can't be sold to people out there, so you need to look into the sales pipeline as it's the foundation for making money in the future. And that as well includes uh, comparing with plan and, you know, having a look at what is, what is probably going to happen. And then having a look into the pipeline of the features that are developed in the product is actually relatively easy because the data is there. You just need to make it available and need to give an overview. And what we do here is basically say, put a green dot when you're in time or a red one when you're below. And then a few of the things you look at, um, other KPIs, like how fast you can solve problems, kind of depends on what business you're in exactly. But really do build KPIs. Use the business people you have on the team, because these guys tend to be incredibly good at doing this. And it tends to help a lot for every CEO discussion, bringing this KPI board, looking at it, and going through it. That brings the discussion to the point, makes it a bit more reasonable. So I think one big question that stands there in the room. So was that it? Is that the magic formula? When we do this, would it all work? And um, we think it's the foundation for the solution, but I think there is, when we see that there's one really big thing missing, and that points to all the CEOs and the decision makers here in the room, um, you actually have to ask yourself, are you as a CEO really capable of coping with a PO that will work with you differently, right? So Pierre will not come into the room anymore and say, oh, this is three potential things we can do. What is the one you want us to do? Pierre will come into the room and say, so we've made five decisions. We changed two things because we thought that was better. Um, and we have two problems that you have to solve for us. It's a completely different way of working. So not only you give away trust, right? You let someone else decide. Uh, you actually have to live with the fact that that someone will come up to you and say, I demand X, Y, Z. It's pretty tough. It's pretty tough for a lot of leaders that are used to being, you know, the, the senior people that can, because they have more experience, make the better decisions, which is not working anymore, right? The POs have more detailed knowledge. They have the better team, so they are better equipped to make decisions. So as a CEO, you really have to ask yourself, can I, can I, can I live with this? And probably better learn to live with it, because if not, you have a problem. And the same thing is, can your organization live with that? So is the organization capable of living with a product team that internally makes decisions? A product team that says, actually, we're not going to work with this vendor anymore because it doesn't work for our product. We're going to work with a different vendor, which is a very interesting conversation uh, with a central, centralized IT unit. Right? So this is probably the most important thing. So it's not the point, can I find POs? They will be in your organization. Can I find the right IT people? They are in your organization. Will they work together? Yes, they will given they have the right surrounding, as we have seen in many of our projects. The real core question is, will you as an organization allow them to work as peers? Once that is there, you'll be surprised because you produce as fast as the startups. And you'll be surprised because the word within the organization spreads super fast. Everyone wants to work like this because it's just so much more fun. It's really cool. Thank you. Questions? or comments. <laughs>